Excellent acoustics in here. Let's do this. Ay, 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 pick a syllable. La, 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 Eloheinu melech ha'olam Asher kitshanu v'mitzvotam V'tzivanu Lehad likner, lehad likner Shel yom hazikaron Sing that again. Shel yom hazikaron we turn on page 1,242. We waste no time to invite ourselves to remind ourselves that it is time to open the gates, which means it's time for us to all be present and ready and real enough with ourselves to bring the fullness of ourselves to those open gates. 1,242. Sometimes I lose my way, I stumble and fall. I fail to see the open door and only see a wall. Sometimes I close my ears when open they should be. But then I stop and listen to that still small voice inside of me peacefully. Sharet Sedeh, Sharet Sedeh, Avova, Avova, Odeya, Odeya, Itfuli, Itfuli, Sharet Sedeh, Sharet Sedeh. I see all life in the works of your hand and walk in love and freedom to the promised land. And when I lose my way, I pray that I may see that spark inside the darkness and the gates open for me. Sharet Sedeh, Avova, Avova, Odeya, Odeya, Itfuli, Itfuli, Sharet Sedeh, Sharet Sedeh. Sharet Sedeh, Avova, Avova, Odeya, Odeya, Pichuli, Pichuli, Sharet Sedeh, Avova, Odeya, Pichuli. Mar Chatima Tova, everyone.
Gemar Hatima Tova, Rabbi. Or Gemar Tov, or Som Kal, or any of the different greetings. But really what it comes down to is, good for you. <laughs> good for you for being here right now. Good for you. I know you just ate, but you're already thinking about the fact that you're done doing that. <laughs> and so our rabbis of the ancient world decide in order to keep us focused, they will name tonight's service the most important, pivotal point of what we do, Kol Nidre. And the words of Kol Nidre can't even be explained as a prayer. There's something even deeper than that. Kol Nidre is a safeguard. And when you are in community, when you love community, you embrace those safeguards. And so this safeguard, this holy safeguard is so crucial because what we're about to do is acknowledge that we are human. Because in the next year, you're going to make a promise. And there's a decent chance, no matter how hard you try, that you might break part of that promise. So how brilliant, what a gift that our, our tradition gives us that says, that's going to probably happen. And that's human. In fact, I might even go as to say that's slightly divine to realize ahead of time that you are probably going to stumble. So rather than put this insane pressure on us that would stop us from being willing to even put one foot in front of the other, we're going to say the words that will nullify just that last sharpness of the promise. You'll do your best throughout this year, I know. When you make a promise, you will intend to keep it. But a vow, a promise, is holy. And so by acknowledging ahead of time that you might stumble, it gives you an ultimate level of freedom to take those risks still. It's such an important prayer, such important words, that we're going to do them three times in a row. We are going to take out all three of our sacred Torah. And we are going to have not three, not six, but nine families that are going to represent the entirety of us holding those texts to know that when you say words like Kol Nidre, they are so sacred, you might as well be tethered to the words themselves of our sacred text. So we're going to be standing for a little while. And I want to warn you of that because I want you to be able to change your state. I want you to be able to stand to focus. I want you to hear these words of Kol Nidre. And if you need to sit for a moment, I want you to do that too. I want you to give yourself the best chance to move forward into this year with pride and with integrity and with some connection to the divine power that you know you are going to do all you can. On page 692, we begin the words of Konidre. If I can ask the Rachelevsky family, the Abram Senator family, to come down and to open our ark. As the ark is open, I ask you to rise. If you are taking on one of the honors of holding Torah, I ask you to come forward as well. And I'm going to situate us just now at the beginning. If I can have Rita, Joe, Mary, and Gabby come forward to open and hold one of our first Torahs, Roz and John Aronson to hold our second Torah, and Dara and Brennan Beer and anyone else from the Beer family to hold the third Torah.
Call me Dre, the Esare, the Harame, the Koname, the Kinuye, the Kinuse, Darna, who the ish tevana, who the acharimna, the dia sarna, alna. Shatana Miyom Kippurim Ze Ad Yom Kippurim Haba Tova Kol Hon Icharat Navechon Kol Hon Yehon Shaharan Shevikim Shevitim betelin umvutalim la shererim vela kayamim dindarna lani. The Esara na la Esare Ushavuata na la Shavu.
Take
You may be seated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please rise. No. <laughs> I want to thank the Rachel Efsky family, the Abrams, <laughs> Senator family, the Cohen family, the Aronson family, the Beer family, the Ehrlich family, the Golden Hirsch and Barsky, Klaus Koch, Hoffman, Spector, and Citric family for coming up, and of course, the Israel family for closing the ark. There is something very profound to having this opportunity to have so many people be a part of our service. But make no mistake, if you are not being called up here, Julie's watching. She's trying to get you to sing along the whole time. So whole time. <laughs> you're all quite <laughs> obligated to be involved in this service. So on page 696, you'll see the words of Shechechianu, words that you should know. So we're going to say this blessing together, and I want to hear all of you, all who know these words, to share in these sacred words together. Say together, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shechechianu V'kiyamanu V'kigiyanu Lazman Chazeh. Praised are you, Adonai, not only for giving us the opportunity to have moments of reflection, introspection, and growth as these, but allowing us, giving us the ability to realize just how important moments like these are and the chance to continuously renew ourselves to be better and better because that is a blessing. And together we say, Amen. now you may rise on page 708. For the words of the Baruch Hu, we have gone through this first pivotal piece of Yom Kippur together. We have nullified our future vows and now we unify our voices and move into a space of true celebratory prayer. Turn to page 712. Peace by Debbie Friedman. If you know it, please sing along. You might know it. Ahavatola.
Turn to page 714 and use one of our deepest and most relevant prayers that we use throughout the year of the Shema to carry that continuity of the everyday into these holy days, but that goes in both directions. What we get out of these holy days needs to be carried back out into the each and every day, all the chances we have to gather and pray on page 714. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Together we chant on 714. The <laughs> Ukshartam le od al yadecha, the hayule totafot bene necha, Uchtav tam al mezuzot betecha, Ubisharecha. We turn to page 728, and then we'll continue on to page 730. And these two prayers that often go hand in hand of Michamocha and Hashkivenu should have even more of a stronghold in the way we see them on this holiest of days. You see, because when we ask who is like you, when we ask who else can have a divine relationship with each and every one of us, the other piece that we're acknowledging in this moment is that we are vulnerable. You open tonight by unpacking any vow you take that leaves us a little unstable. We have to feel a little vulnerable in order to do this work. So as we sing our Micha Mocha and then move into Hashki Venu, allow that to liturgically make the statement that you know you cannot be alone. You have to recognize how lucky you are to have this relationship. And also that it is perfectly okay. It is sacred to acknowledge when we need help and we need comfort and we need that love. On page 728, we sing the words of Micha Mocha. Micha Mocha Boelim Adonai Micha Mocha Nedar Bakodesh No Malechutecha, Rauva Necha, Bokea Yam, Lifne Moshe. The 
Ne emar ki fa dado naed ya akol Uga alom yad chazak mimenu Baruch ata Adonai Gal Israel Our friend Sherry Citric Field is here and to sing, we sing this song each year together. And it is such a, this moment gives me such shelter, not to overstate the importance of the Hashkivenu. This beautiful prayer, this beautiful setting Beautiful Sherry is going to sing sing with us. This was written by cantor Linda Hirschhorn, and I mention it because she's such a prolific writer, and um, I also, while we're here, contemplating all this, all these evening things and shelter and. I want to also thank our dear Peggy Baldwin, who is here. This is, I think, her 10th year. Also providing us not just support, but a shelter. Exactly what we all need. So, Sherry? on Hashki venu le shalom ve hami deinu le khayim u fro saleinu sukat shlomecha sukat shlomecha Shmor tzeiteinu uvoeinu lechaim ulishalom meata veadolam ufrosaleinu sukat shlomecha sukat shlomecha. Give us this night time to lie in peace. May we rise to new life each day. And let there be shelter for the brokenhearted, a shelter of love for all. life and peace from now and ever on and let there be
be shelter for the broken hearted the shelter of the cross a shelter of love for all. Asher Koach. Asher Koach, Sharon, would you play for us? We turn to page 782. 782, Yale, the blessings as we move into forgiveness, asking that everything that we're giving this moment, every breath of prayer and of love, be heard by allowing it to rise up, to meet the expectations of this moment. On page 782, we listen to these words. Yaaleh yishenu me'arev v'avoto reinu
turn to page 812. The words of Adonai, Adonai. And I'm not just talking to give Julie a moment to catch her breath. Oh boy, this is a lot of singing. It's the best. But Adonai, Adonai actually <laughs> models, models the opposite side of what we are doing through Yom Kippur. In this moment, we are acknowledging our mistakes. We are apologizing for our transgressions. We are working towards being a better version of ourselves. And what we're given in response is a beautiful modeling of acceptance. That a God, a God that's loving and gracious, patient and abundant and kind and truth, continue to keep that kindness for thousands of years, forgiving sin, for forgiving rebellion, for forgiving transgression. There is no limitation to the patience of God according to these words of Adonai, Adonai. I'm not saying there's some other moments in our tradition you could push back on me on for this idea. But in these words, in this moment, it is a sacred modeling. How do we handle giving forgiveness to others? Do we channel this level of love and forgiveness? Are we willing to give people those chances of abundance, never-ending patience in this moment? As we sing these words of Adonai, Adonai, I ask you all to rise and decide whether or not each one of you, each one of us, has risen to the occasion of being that sacred of a space to accept the wrongdoings of others and give them the chance to breathe once again. Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum, Vechanun, Erech Apayim, Virov Chesed, Veemet. No Tse Chesed Lalafim, No Se Avon Vafesha, Vehata'a. Then I can sing that again. Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum, the Hanun, Erechapayim, Virov Chesed, the Emmet. No Te Chesed Lalafim, No Se Avon Vafesha. Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum, the Hanun, Erechapayim, Virov Chesed, the Emmet, No Te Chesed, Lalafim, No Se. We turn now to page 815, 814, for the Shema Koleinu, hear our voices, hear our voices. Again with our beloved Peggy Baldwin and our irreplaceable Michael Asher. No one replaces Michael Asher. And here he is over there. <laughs> you can't see him. Um, but this uh, Shema Koleinu, let's, uh, let's, let's sing this together. Shema Koleinu Adonai Eloheinu Chus v'rachem aleinu 
Rachem Aleinu Shema Koleinu Adonai Eloheinu Chus Verachem Aleinu Rachem Aleinu Vikabel Birahamim Ubratzon Et Tefilatenu Tefilatenu Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Venashuva Hadesh yameinu kekedem Shema koleinu Adonai Eloheinu Chus virachem aleinu Rachem aleinu Shema kole enu Adonai Eloheinu Chus v'rachem aleinu Rachem aleinu Shema kole You may be seated. You may take a bathroom break. You may take a nap. Love. There's a topic to jump right into, huh? Love, it evolves, it changes throughout our lives. As we grow and we become more complex, so does love. I have had love outside of that of my family's love since I was young. A love that continuously transformed, a powerful love that shaped part of who I am. Love is funny, isn't it? It's not always romance. Love can be hard. And I'm struggling a lot with love. And one of the oldest loves in my life that's making some really dangerous choices. And I don't see it turning around anytime soon. And that scares me. It leaves me hard choices to make. Do I give up on that love? Do I double down? Can I possibly have a relationship so pivotal and core to who I am, just tossed away? I was 16 years old when I first visited the land of Israel. And I fell in love. It was a mixed, complicated experience, and I struggled for a long time to figure out what box to put that relationship in. It was clearly love. That much was easy. But was it somehow my identity? Was it a place? Was it a familial notion? I, I didn't have the answer. Now look, when I was 14 years old, I took a Jewish star sticker to the orthodontist. I asked for my retainer to have a blue white, a, white, a blue stripe, a white stripe, and a blue stripe. Stuck the sticker in the middle. I think it was the first time the orthodontist made an Israeli flag for a retainer, but here I was. <laughs> so it wasn't like I just discovered that love. But it was different. I'm even a little trepidatious and nervous right now talking about the vulnerability of this love. But that same 
emotional beauty and difficulty that I'm standing with right now is exactly how I felt 16 years old, standing at the Kotel, seeing problems and beauty and everything in between and holding it all so true. Now this summer, Jen and I had the opportunity, the incredible chance to bring our children to Israel for the first time. I am so jealous of my kids who got to experience the land for the first time at such a formative age and to begin to solidify more than Israel as a flag that they wave around on Yom Ha'atzma'ud or a bowl of hummus, though I do have a good cheat recipe if you need one. I was overwhelmed with so many emotions, complex, rich emotions, as I showed this land that I love to my kids. I was wrestling with how to approach it as a parent, what to expose them to, not to force too much of my own views, and how to see this place through their eyes as their father. Would they obsess over the food? Would they feel something when they walked down the street on Friday night saying Shabbat Shalom to everyone that passed? I had to explain to them that that was Shabbat Shalom and not Tuesday afternoon when we were walking through other areas, but they really caught on to the Shabbat Shalom part. In Israel's national anthem, Hatikva, a song that translates as the hope, is a poem of love, connection, and of course, hope. As long as an inner heart, a Jewish soul still yearns, our hope has not been lost. The hope of 2,000 years. To be a free nation in our land, the land of Zion and Yerushalayim. That the Jewish soul is yearning, and the historical desire for a homeland, that yearning is love. The national anthem achieves a level of forever love, an evolving, continuous love. For those of you who have not been aware of the ongoings in Israel, the current prime minister's extreme right-wing coalition, a government with what some can only call radicals, has gone after the judicial system, trying to diminish the power of the courts in an attempt to hijack the democracy of the state. This is created an internal strife unlike any the small but mighty country has faced since 1948. This current government does not hold a true mandate of the people anymore, and they've been strategically stripping away at social progress and deconstructing the building blocks that others have laid out with an extreme motivation behind them. I would be lying through my teeth if I didn't admit to you how challenging even saying those words are or how embarrassed and how scary those moments have felt for me when watching some of this. Yet, the Israeli people did not sit stagnant or silent. They started week by week taking to the streets, protesting and making their voices heard, growing in steadfast numbers each and every week over the last nine months. It's been a rebirth of part of the Israeli soul, hearing the voices, it's true magic. There's an Israeli author, Edgar Carrick, who shared his perspective in an article, Israeli democracy is in danger. Didn't bury the lead there. In Carrick's observation, he said the protests are unlike anything he's ever seen in his life. It crosses all political divides. He says, my whole life, I've never been to a demonstration with so many people with whom I had nothing else in common with, except for demonstrating. To my left were hipsters, To my right were high-tech entrepreneurs, behind me were communists, a range of rich and poor people and the army and consent and conscientious objectors. And what they all have in common is not being willing to lose their democracy. And others have called out for our involvement. At different points over the last decade, I have heard things. I've been told to my face, if you don't live here, how can you comment? If you're not going to be here, how can you possibly say anything? But over these last nine months, I've stopped hearing that from all but the extremes. And centrist core voices have called out, begging the diaspora voice to be involved. As diaspora Jews, we have both the right and the responsibility to critique the government in pivotal moments like this. If the Israeli people can take to the street week after week, speaking their truth in opposition, then those who love Israel need to do the same from their homes in connection with the protesters. Am Yisrael, a people with a remarkable bond. There's a teacher in Israel named Micha Goodman, a well-known voice and and, uh, thinker. 
And during these last nine months, he shared something that I found truly troubling. He shared this political moment in the historical context of what he calls the curse of the eighth decade. You see, there's only been two other times in the history that the Jews have had autonomy over a state. The first, King David's dynasty 3,000 years ago. The second, the Hasmonean dynasty. Both instances, internal strife, complication, and fighting from within started the downfall and the destruction of those moments in time in the eighth decade. We are the third opportunity. In an experiment founded in 1948, this is the 75th year. We are inching towards that eighth decade. And we have to learn from history. And we have to take pause and even be scared by the very notion. If we don't get involved, if we don't voice concern, we could be complacent in the curse of the eighth decade happening again. And this should illuminate a responsibility in all of us to understand that blindly supporting Israel without criticism is not an act of love, but an act of fear. If you are so fearful that you are not willing to say anything that isn't love, love and loving something, you speak. If you believe in a strong Israel, you have nuanced and thoughtful conversations. The love is critical. And if we simply blindly support and reject any criticism, we're actually hurting the longevity of our homeland. On Rosh Hashanah, I talked about being comfortable in landscapes of external and eternal change and transformation. And just as we find grounding in our own changes, we have to find that grounding in our relationship with Israel as well. Change is not a sign of instability, but a hallmark of vibrant living nation. Our love must be adaptable and resilient to accommodate this dynamic future. And these protesters have shown that the true soul of Israel is not lost at all. They have linked the words of Hatikva, Odlo, Avda, Tikva, Tenu. They have preserved the true hope within their words. Their actions have made clear that the citizens do not support the dismantling of democracy. They have showcased that the heartbeat of reason still beats loudly in their land. This summer when we were there, I was fortunate enough to be at one of the protests. We were staying just minutes away from the house of the prime minister, and as I walked to the protest, I was around thousands of Israelis smiling and laughing and cheerfully walking to allow their voice to be heard, tying the flag around their neck as a cape, truly happy to know that their voice mattered. And it prompted a very real soul-searching for me. Being both loving and critical is a sign of nuanced and thoughtful relationship. The same nuance that is reflected in our name, Yisrael, we invite our entire community on a regular basis to wrestle with the most basic tenets of our faith. Not sure you believe in God? Fine. Don't know what kind of diet you want? Doesn't matter. You wrestle with your own version of Judaism. You connect however you need to connect. And yet, when it comes to Israel, somehow we coward. Pull back and say there's a right way to do Zionism. There's a right way to engage and love. There's nothing I care about in this world, nothing that I deeply love and I want to succeed that I would ever, ever support without engaging and voicing concerns in moments that matter. In our tradition, there's a moment, a uh, notion of tochecha, an idea that says when you see something and you see someone doing something that doesn't hold up to Jewish value, you must speak out. Make no mistake. Critique is an act of love and a call for Israel to fulfill its promise to be a democracy and a just society. And if we don't, we may have to contend with a world without an Israel, as unthinkable as that is to say. And I assume for many of you, it's unthinkable to hear. It's something that we have to acknowledge if we're not willing to take on a certain burden of this love. It is extremely challenging to think of something you love being threatened from within. 
it hurts our hearts to think of something, someone we love being threatened from within. But our love for Israel is not simply an emotional love. It's a committed love. And the thing about committed love is that while steadfast, it is soaked in responsibility and active participation. You each deserve your own relationship with Israel. You each deserve to have your own deep and critical and curious relationship with our homeland, one that brings you to all these different spaces of love and hope. We're being given permission from within. We're witnessing the vitality and resilience of the Israeli spirit. We have the chance to feed that spirit in this moment. The same spirit that allowed a group of dreamers to establish a vibrant country, truly one that has the potential to be a light to the world. I fell deeper in love with Israel over these last nine months. Nine months. Because in these last nine months, the voices of the Israeli spirit were amplified louder than they've ever been amplified in my lifetime. I have faith in that Israeli soul. The soul that can withstand strife. The soul that with a nurturing and loving acts from diaspora can lead to a more whole version of the state. This past week, Netanyahu did a little tour of America. And each stop on his tour. He was met by thousands of protesters voicing concern. Am Israel, the Jewish people, thousands speaking out. And if my words have somehow pushed you to even question hope, wait, this hope is not lost. How amazing is it that there is a democracy in the Middle East where you can voice these concerns without the threat of your life. Look at Iran over the past year, speaking out for truths that also matter with countless lives being lost because it isn't a safe space to voice concern. There is no reason to have lost hope, but there is a reason to be critically engaged and involved. Let's look at Netanyahu just a little deeper. I know I got all the way until now without really saying too much of his name. But Bibi Netanyahu is a very important character in the Israel story. He was a hero and a strategist that got Israel through some really important moments in time. But what happens when a good voice becomes a bad actor? What do you do with that love? Should I give up on my love for Israel for re-electing Netanyahu once his intentions changed? Are you prepared to give up on your home if the wrong people are elected at some point in your future? Throughout history, the flag of any given country has served to symbolize the people of power. That's just a fact. It's the way it works. The flag symbolizes government. And that's really tricky for people and civilians in moments of civil unrest. But the Israeli protesters have done something remarkable. They've taken their flag back. They've sent a clear message that the symbolism transcends any individual interpretation or political regime. That same flag that hangs on street lamps, adorns business windows, flown all over the state, that same flag is theirs in their moment of opposition. This summer, Levi and Sammy were very confused as to why there were so many flags everywhere. They even asked, is it Israel's birthday? Because the only time they had seen that in the American discourse is the 4th of July but they have a different relationship to that flag. They allow that to be part of the shining out to the world. They allow that symbol to hold its space. This reclamation of the flag has served as a powerful testament to the enduring spirit of Israeli democracy. They've reclaimed it. They've infused it with new breath of life. It's no longer merely a symbol of government. Their flag that they continue to wave has become an unspoken symbol of connection throughout thousands of years and the fact that there is nothing to give up on yet. The heartbeat of the Israeli experiment deserves love. And equally important, you deserve that love. You deserve a complicated and amazing relationship. You deserve for a piece of your heart to be uncomfortably set aside across the world. You deserve to engage in these words of Am Yisrael. Think deeply about your own relationship to Israel and how you can love responsibly, particularly in complex political times. That love is the kind that reminds us to navigate even the most messy, contentious, painful situations with a call for hope. Let that anthem, anthem of Hatikva be.
be a guiding light, reminding us that Israel's potential isn't diminished by challenge. It's being fueled, and their story is still unfolding. See your love as having something on the line, that to love Israel is to connect on many levels this tapestry of love, of logic, and of symbolism. That when you say Yisrael or Yerushalayim in your prayers, you are tying ancient words into living out your Jewish values. Because the difficult and complex love, that's the love that we benefit and grow from the most. That's the love that becomes a shining spot of our identity. That's the love that matters. I have more than hope. I have faith that we as a people will not let Israel find itself in the curse of the eighth decade again because we are now an interconnected world, a connected people, both of the diaspora and those in the homeland. That's what didn't exist the first two times in Israel's story. We are the variable to the dilemma. And if we decide to face the state with apathy and not with an act of love, then why shouldn't history repeat itself? We are Am Yisrael. The great experiment isn't separate from our experience. The great experiment is part of us too. Let us hold the hope that as a collective love and as an action of the people, both within and outside of our homeland, we can guide it towards a future that aligns with his deepest and truest values. Am Yisrael Chai. on page 820. <laughs> now you all have to rise too. We say these words of Ashamnu and then move Thank forward you. into al Thank Shatanu lefanecha. Thank you for saying all of that. Thank you. We are going to engage in our recognition of our transgressions in two ways. The first is our Ashamnu. The first is about us acknowledging all transgressions and taking responsibility for us as a community across this holy world. And then we'll move into our chet, shatanu lefanecha, and this notion of our individual sin. On page 820, we take our fist, we begin, we get ready. We sing these words of Hashem. <laughs> Asham nu, Asham nu, Bagad nu, Bagad nu, Gazal nu, Gazal nu, Dibar nu dofi, Dibar nu dofi, Lai la 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 Vahir Shanu Zad Nu Zad Nu Hamas Nu Hamas Nu Tafal Nu Shaker Tafal Nu Shaker Ay 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 ay
on page 828. We are going to go through our alchit. What we're going to do is read them in the English and then break on the piece Julie will sing with us, Ba'al Kulam. Please join me for the wrong that we have done before you in the closing of the heart and for the wrong that we have done before you without knowing what we do, for the wrong that we have done before you, whether opened or concealed, and for the wrong that we have done before you knowingly and by deceit, for the wrong that we have done before you through the prompting of the heart, and for the wrong that we have done before you through the influence of others, for the wrong we have done before you, whether by intention or mistake, and for the wrong that we have done before you by the hand of violence, for the wrong that we have done before you through our foolishness of speech, and for the wrong that we have done before you through evil inclination. We read them all, God, of forgiveness. Please forgive us, pardon us, help us atone. They are cool. Selah lanu mechalanu kaper lanu ve'al kulam elohas lichot selah lanu mechalanu selah lanu. Page 829, we continue. For the wrong that we have done before you in the palming of a bribe, and for the wrong that we have done before you by expressions of contempt, for the wrong that we have done before you through misuse of food and drink, and for the wrong that we have done before you by our avarice and greed, for the wrong that we have done before you through offensive gaze, and for the wrong that we have done before you through the condescension of gaze. And for them all, God of forgiveness, please forgive us, pardon us, help us atone. They are For the wrong that we have done before you by our quickness to oppose, and for the wrong that we have done before you by deception of a friend, for the wrong that we have done before you by unwillingness to change, and for the wrong that we have done before you by our own running to embrace an evil act, for the wrong that we have done before you by our groundless hatred, and for the wrong that we have done before you in the giving of false pledge. And for them all, God of forgiveness, please forgive us, pardon us, and help us atone. <laughs> Page 460, we sing the words of Avinu Malkenu. Avinu 
few quick announcements. Thank you to all of you who have already given to the KI annual food drive. Please remember that each year we work towards the holy task of feeding those in need in our community. We are only one third of the way to even reaching last year's collection, but again, don't lose hope. We've got time. If you want to make donations, you can always go to our website. Our High Holiday page has the chance to make donations or I'm sure someone can help you after the services. Tomorrow, please join us for more Yom Kippur. You might have noticed that we don't use certain prayers. We don't say Kaddish tonight because this started a service that does not end till tomorrow around 645. So come back tomorrow and join us for our services at 10 a.m. After our service, we will have an opportunity for those who want to engage in congregational study at 1 o'clock. From 2 to 4 o'clock, this room will be open. The chance for meditation, contemplation, pause. At 4 o'clock, we'll be meeting in the social hall. We will have our mincha service there. Then we'll be streaming our speaker at 4.30. For those who haven't heard, our speakers are Gary Wright and David Kaczynski. And for those who haven't heard that yet or have recognized that name, yes, David is the brother of the Unabomber. And David was the one that, after reading the manifesto published in the papers, turned his brother in, never to speak with his brother again, but taking on the mantle of responsibility of reaching out to those who were hurt, those who survived but life changed. And Gary is one of the few that responded to his reaching out, and the two of them come together to talk about resilience, hope, humanity, apologizing after that, we will continue on with our Yisker and our Ne'ila services. This building will not close tomorrow. For any of you who want to be here throughout the day, who want to give that part of your Yom Kippur experience, I invite you to. And if not, know that there are always avenues to come back in throughout the day. This is a different day. Last year, we ended by just stopping. And many of you said, Rabbi, that felt awkward. <laughs> I appreciate the honesty in this moment. That's love. That's good. So what we are going to do is we are going to echo the words that we began with. The words of Pitchuli, realizing that we have to keep the gates open for the next day as we work towards our moment of truth throughout our Yom Kippur. I invite you to sing along with us. I also invite you to simply walk out to these words, to allow these words to be a part of the connection from this moment until we see you again tomorrow morning. Sometimes I lose my way, I stumble and fall. I fail to see the open doors and only see the wall. Sometimes I close my ears when open they should be.
But then I stop and listen to that still small voice inside of me. Pete Hooley. Pete Hooley. Share it, said it. Share it, said it. 